Hey everyone, this is our episode for Friday, May 22nd, 2020. The Ferguson uprising catalyzed conversations and sparked action around racial equity in the St. Louis region. And in the following years, we've seen the growth of new research, movements, and programs that center the experiences of Black people. But the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on African Americans across the nation and in St. Louis raises a crucial question. Are we paying attention to the fact that uh, Black people are disproportionately likely to die Uh, And they are also um, excluded from the tables of critical and most core leadership of regional response. In this episode, we talk to three Black leaders who've been centering racial equity in their work and learn their perspectives on investment, community health, and regional response during the pandemic. I'm Jalian Yang, and from St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here. During a national emergency like a pandemic, federal aid and philanthropy are a major part of responding to the crisis. But the task of distributing that funding and deciding where it should be allocated eventually falls to foundations and nonprofit organizations. And how they approach that task determines whether or not crisis response is equitable. Philanthropy tends to mobilize in the months immediately following a crisis, whether that's human-made uh, or, uh, or an act of God, as it were, to respond to the crisis. Reverend Dr. Starsky Wilson co-chaired the Ferguson Commission, which was tasked with examining how social and economic conditions impede progress, equality, and safety in St. Louis in the aftermath of the Ferguson Uprising. And he's the president and chief executive of Deaconess Foundation, which aims to improve health in the St. Louis region. And his team has been tracking how local and national philanthropy responds to a crisis like a pandemic. Uh, We see philanthropy double down uh, on its pre-crisis grant-making protocols and procedures, meaning uh, if you couldn't get a grant before, you're probably not going to be able to get one after. The most dangerous is when these things have economic impacts. We then see the adjustment of grant-making protocols Uh, to preserve resources in the philanthropy versus helping the community. These responses are about reducing risk based on normal investment practices, but the pandemic is set to have warlike impacts on the economy and people's lives. The perpetual nature of the endowment doesn't matter if, you know, one in seven people in the economy uh, are without jobs right now or if we lose life to the tune of six figures across the country. This is not normal, so we should do what's extraordinary in our giving and give more. Reverend Wilson is mobilizing the Deaconess Foundation's resources to lead by example, investing $2.2 million toward a grant that supports Black-led organizations doing social service and social change work in St. Louis. They are critically responsible for framing what just recovery will be like. Uh, So we're talking about, you know, organizations whose capacity has been built up in the last five years since the Ferguson uprising. These organizations will be given unrestricted operating support to get them through a time when many nonprofits are having to make difficult decisions to cut budgets, furlough employees, or even lay off longtime staff. And this investment is critical because Black people are among those most impacted by the shortcomings of our health care system. Some of the stuff we're dealing with now, we wouldn't be dealing with if we had listened to these marginalized voices before. In an environment of universal health care and access, you would have more people who have been black and brown to have been tested earlier, less people exposed. When we have these immense and significant challenges, we tend to find people who are able to elevate out of the role of regular everyday citizen to guide and marshal our work. And he hopes these regular, everyday people can be at the table to determine what's done with federal aid during this crisis and beyond. Government will always be the primary payer as it relates to social services in the American economy. As much as philanthropy gets a lot of shine and a lot of light, uh, it actually does not invest anything compared to what the government does. So it's critical that the citizenry be well positioned to impact the dollars that are get the, that are distributed through the various forms of government. He points out that investing in organizing, advocacy, and public policy change can have a multiplier effect. For every $1 philanthropy spends on community organizing, 
it returns $115 of government investment and benefit. So what we know is those social services are critically important and we know we can assure that there are more social services by investing in social change. The more we invest in organizing and advocacy, the greater return there will be to support direct services in this moment and in the future. And for Reverend Wilson, a pastor and activist who has ministered for over a decade in church and on the streets, investing in Black-led organizing and advocacy efforts is a major step toward healing and reconciliation. A critical 21st century uh, articulation of reconciliation has to be racial equity. It's not relational. It has to be real, right? It's not sentimental. It has to be borne out statistically. And so when I think about reconciliation, I think about not the reduction, but the elimination of disparities between people. If it's the case that African Americans actually are 45.9% of the city of St. Louis population, then at no point in the trajectory should they be 100% of the deaths, nor now should they be 70% of the deaths uh, from coronavirus. So reconciliation for me is not just about whether they get along with white people, but it's about whether the statistics related to their life expectancy are actually the same. And for me, it is absolutely not. It is unacceptable to speak of the reduction of disparity, uh, the reduction of inequity. Rather, these things have to actually be equal. That is the definition of population level, community level reconciliation. When our lives in this economy, when our lives in this health context, when our lives in this community actually mean the same thing, that's when we can say that we have healed the land. And that's when we can say we've truly been reconciled. Determining where federal and private dollars should go is a major step toward ensuring that crisis response is equitable. Then, the challenge is ensuring that those dollars are spent in neighborhoods that are most impacted by the virus, and that those investments are backed by public health research that center the needs of communities that are hit hardest by the shortcomings of our healthcare system. So up next, we're going to hear from the former managing director of the Ferguson Commission, who's been coordinating how community health workers respond with public health campaigns and resource distribution. And we're going to talk to someone who has consulted for the Ferguson Commission based on their research on the impact of social determinants of health on African-American well-being in St. Louis and learn from their experience with leading a regional pandemic response team. For a conversation about how investments in pandemic response make their way to community health workers on the ground and why outreach to neighborhoods most impacted by the virus determine if the response is equitable, we're turning to Bethany johnson Javois, the CEO of the Integrated Health Network, which brings together the St. Louis region's safety net health care providers to provide care for those who are underserved by the health care system. The very first stories coming to my attention came to me on text with an SOS about workers who were concerned about going to jobs where they were not getting strong communication. They were not getting a sense of being protected or being valued in their jobs and bringing potentially something home to their family and to their loved ones. These concerns from essential workers were echoed by healthcare safety net providers who were starting to conduct testing, also without personal protective equipment. And as the virus began to take lives, she started to ache because the grief and bereavement that followed was getting too heavy to hold. The faith community struggles because pastors go directly to congregants to visit hospitals. They go directly to homes to embrace, to love, and to care for. And the number one thing that we have been trained to do, we cannot do. And so how do you offer comfort and support? The first reported cases in the city of St. Louis were Black women who died of COVID-19, identify as a Black woman. And looking at those faces and relating to that experience hit me very differently in this pandemic time frame. And the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on predominantly African-American communities reminded her of the Ferguson Commission's findings on geography and health outcomes. 
now we're talking about death rates that are intensifying in some specific zip codes, especially in North City and North County. But when we look at the factors that are exacerbating it, it feels very eerily similar to the commission's time where um, access to transportation, access to strong cell phone coverage, uh, economic mobility, economic insecurity, strong jobs with which to work and to be seen as viable, the ability to protect life and body is still relevant and connected right now. Bethany hopes that because the pandemic impacts people across race, the calls to center racial equity will be taken more seriously than they were when the Ferguson Commission first began. This pandemic now affecting a broader reach of people, um, affecting so much broader of a swath, is beginning to elevate the issues of racial equity because more folks now are understanding impact because they too are exposed in addition to the community um, that we had centered during the commission's time. And that insight has activated people a bit differently because their skin in the game, if you will, their connectedness to us, right, is much more close, it seems to me. And so that's giving us a way to activate in the funding space a way to activate in communication that we're having, where people are having insights quicker than five years ago when we were trying to elevate what is equity and what is racial equity. This increased regional understanding of the importance of racial equity has energized her work with Prepare STL, a collaborative campaign by the Missouri Foundation for Health with the Regional Health Commission, the City of St. Louis, St. Louis County, and other community health organizations to prepare St. Louisans for the effects of COVID-19 response, stop the spread, and survive the pandemic. We should also note that the Missouri Foundation for Health is a sponsor of We Live Here, but has no control over our content. Bethany says the goal is to not only provide accurate information, it should also be sincere and trusted. Communications is not just what you put on air and what you put as talking points on a website. Communication is about making sure that there are individuals with lived experience from the communities that we are serving, that are trusted faces, that are communicating to you what is happening and what you need to do and how you need to respond and having in hand the types of things that can help you, like masks, like hand sanitizer, real live ways to let you know that you are supported in this time frame. We know the community, we know the patient, we are them, and we understand how best to activate in this moment the institutions that need to be deeper in their analysis of what response needs to look like. Community health workers and community organizers create a feedback loop where their outreach allows community members to access services and resources, such as masks, hand sanitizer, and mobile testing sites, while also giving community members an opportunity to keep them updated about their evolving needs. Know the zip codes, know the communities within those zip codes, prioritize the dollar investment, and the human capital investment that has to go into those areas, often isolated, and really put the human face to the resource in real time and stay connected to translate, not only when we go out to meet neighbor X, but when neighbor X communicates to us that something is missing, we take that information and it becomes part of the strategy for the next time that we outreach. So this isn't a one and done, Their work hasn't gone unnoticed, resulting in regional leaders coming to prepare STL for advice on how to allocate CARES Act dollars through participatory budgeting models. People are getting out of the way, trying to think about releasing barriers, trying to be creative, and frankly, trusting the people who have the wisdom to lead and to know when to step in to help and when to step back to allow for that uh, kinetic community-based energy to do what it does and heal itself. And centering racial equity at decision-making tables has allowed for important discussions around triage to happen. Uh, Specifically, for example, racial equity lens on ventilators, right? We are happy to know and to say that in terms of thinking about the algorithm as to how people of color and Black people would be prioritized, Um, based on their symptoms, based on some of the inherent things that in these um, algorithms, you know, would unintentionally influence a decision about who does and who does not get a ventilator has been discussed here in this region. Not only has it been discussed, but we were happy to know and to press on the fact that St. Louis does not have to worry about that because of the proactive work 
and the advocacy to ensure that those who need it and those who need it most uh, will have that access. And yet, crisis response is still unfolding as physical distancing requirements are relaxed and health officials warn of a second wave of COVID-19 cases. Bethany suggests that protecting essential workers who are more likely to be African-American from exposure to the virus is a racial equity issue. And our workers are afraid, they are concerned, they are scared, and they don't have the information they need to be well-equipped and uh, able to, to, to come back to work to help the economy. We have a campaign and have already met some of those smaller goals of making sure that the masks that are cloth, that can be washed, that can be used over and over again are supplied to everyone in the region, particularly those that need them. As we know, there will increasingly be enforcement on uh, if you're able to come into a building, you will be required to have X. And some of our community members cannot meet those requirements. They simply don't have it. So really specifically, um, that would be my specific ask, is help and support to make sure that uh, the hand sanitizer and those specific needs are met so that workers are equipped to be able to protect themselves. But with African Americans being racially profiled across the nation for wearing or not wearing a mask, and the toll that COVID-19 continues to take on Black communities, the ongoing work for racial equity will require a substantial shift in thinking. We have presented the data, we have elevated policy, we have communicated through story, we have communicated through artists, we have marched in the street. So I just ask people as I ask myself, you know, to, to what extent, why, what is, for what reasons do you not know? For what reasons have you not completely enacted and, and dug in? What will it take? What will it take at this point for you to continue to have the race consciousness without the crisis? The more we can accelerate what is unconscious and make that conscious, name that, identify that unapologetically, unflinchingly, and begin to activate As citizens who understand the risk and the reward together, the better. What we need to be doing is ensuring that we continue open communication in our uh, safety net system, that our providers, yes, we have regional boundaries, we have, you know, these really specific developed ways with which we're supposed to operate within jurisdictions. But some of that, frankly, has to be blurred because people travel from one zip code to a whole nother place. And so we've got to continue to think as a region, we are doing some of that work, but that needs to increase. Equity is important. Justice is critical. Uh, Health and well-being for all is what is essential for this economy and for this leadership to make it not only through this crisis, because there will be more to come, uh, but to make sure that we're staying together on the same page. Even though there's still work left to do to shift the region's priorities, Bethany acknowledges that St. Louis has changed since the Ferguson uprising, because now it is harder to argue against the importance of racial equity. In large part, this is because of the For the Sake of All report, which makes the case for how social determinants of health, like education, income, and access to community resources, impact the health and well-being of African Americans in St. Louis. Its recommendations range from increasing access to quality education and healthy food to partnering with community health workers to coordinate chronic and infectious disease prevention and management, all of which have heightened in importance during the pandemic. This report has guided Bethany and Reverend Wilson's work, impacting on-the-ground community health work and top-level philanthropy decisions alike. Dr. Jason Purnell is an associate professor at the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis and the principal investigator of the For the Sake of All report, a major study on health inequity in the St. Louis area. He also advised the Ferguson Commission on matters of health equity and witnessed firsthand how the region began to acknowledge the importance of racial equity as research from his team gave language and numbers for the stories and calls to action coming from the streets. It's not a secret that there were racial disparities of all kinds prior to Ferguson. And of course, we tried to contribute to a long and ongoing conversation about that through the work of the For the Sake of All report that was released in May of 2014. And of course, unfortunately, 
not even three months later, Michael Brown was shot and killed in Ferguson. And the issues in St. Louis were laid bare for the whole world to see. Dr. Purnell and Bethany are now among the co-authors for a recent report entitled The Disproportionate Impact of COVID-19 on Black and African American Communities in the St. Louis Region, which outlines zip code level data to reveal the toll that the virus is taking on predominantly Black communities in North St. Louis City and North St. Louis County. The report calls for immediate policy action to address disparities through culturally competent public health education campaigns, strategically placing testing sites in neighborhoods most impacted by chronic conditions, and tracking COVID-19 outcomes on a patient and community level by race. I think the hope is that there hasn't really been pushback among the partners that we're engaging with on the need to center racial equity. And in part, that's just because of the starkness of the data that we're seeing in terms of who's getting sick and sadly who's dying of COVID-19. You can't argue with that. But he says that regional investment in racial equity work is still lacking and that unaddressed health disparities are creating the disturbing outcomes we're now seeing in the pandemic. It is the result of conscious choices made at multiple levels of government, aided and abetted by private industry, Uh, and other institutions over several decades. So what I've said is what we're facing right now is a tragedy, but it's not an accident. Decades of disinvestment and structural racism have a daily impact on African Americans who are trying to survive the virus today. When the order comes down to stay at home and there's no grocery store in your neighborhood and you're working a job and living paycheck to paycheck and don't have the means to stock up on things like toilet paper. And you don't have the luxury of staying home because you're working an hourly service job that requires you to leave home. You may be living in a home that is multi-generational without enough room, even if you needed to, to isolate someone if they were sick. These are all of kind of the hypotheses around why we're seeing the spread of this disease. I heard the former head of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation say that the choices you make are based on the choices you have. And the choice set is not the same for someone living in a neighborhood where the grocery stores are gone, the jobs are gone, the banks are gone, the hospitals are gone. You're not making a fair demand when you ask people to make better choices. Dr. Purnell now leads the St. Louis COVID Regional Response Team, which brings together over 40 St. Louis nonprofits, social service agencies, and governments to help people access resources during the pandemic. Equity is the purpose of the Regional Response Team. It's not a, it's not an afterthought. And that's the way I've been talking about this with folks. Too often, the most vulnerable populations are an afterthought and they get the leftover attention, the leftover resources the scraps. And what we've said in organizing the regional response team is that the most vulnerable populations, including African Americans who are bearing the brunt of this virus, have to be central to the conversation. And the whole idea is how do we coordinate our efforts to effectively and efficiently and wisely respond to the needs of the most vulnerable populations. He adds that this level of coordination will require overcoming regional fragmentation and making sure that areas such as East St. Louis, which is predominantly Black and located on the Illinois side of the bi-state St. Louis region, aren't left behind. The way that we do business is fragmented, and that includes not just, you know, the 80 plus municipalities in St. Louis County and the, you know, the distinction between uh, the various counties in the region. It also includes the way nonprofits work, the way philanthropy works, the way life happens in St. Louis. Like Reverend Wilson and Bethany, Dr. Pinnell believes that shifting health outcomes toward racial equity will require substantial and intentional investment. You can mouth the words collaboration and coordination, but unless it's somebody's job to actually get that done, it's not going to happen. And people are going to revert to the default setting, which is to take care of my institution or my organization or my sector. And we really have to have infrastructure to make that change because no one institution, 
no one jurisdiction is going to figure out a challenge of this magnitude. And the challenge of working toward racial equity during a pandemic extends to economic recovery as well. We cannot recover from this crisis in the same old way. And that's going to require some real forward thinking among institutions that control resources and power in the St. Louis region. At some point, businesses are going to bounce back. And what they need to do going forward is invest and buy and hire in the places that were hardest hit by this virus. And those are the same places that have seen disinvestment for decades. That's how we have to recover from this. Lately, Dr. Purnell has been turning his attention toward research by sociology professors Chris Benner and Manuel Pastor that suggests that equity is the best way to bring about economic growth. What they found is that in metropolitan areas where you see both equity and economic growth go hand in hand, you have to have these coordinating structures that I've been talking about. What they call it is an epistemic community. You've got to have a common language around what are our problems, how are we going to solve them together, and we don't, we lack that in St. Louis. We don't always have the single table at which we make those kinds of decisions and come to those determinations, but it's, it's deeply necessary and sorely needed, and we're seeing some of the impacts of not having that in this current crisis. If there are two houses on the block that are on fire, you don't knock on everybody's door in the neighborhood and ask how much water you need. You train all the water you have on the two houses that are on fire. And the data is showing us what's on fire. And we need to train our resources on what's on fire. In the short term, that means getting people the basic necessities and healthcare they need to survive. We have to start by deploying the basic needs to the hardest hit areas of the region. And that includes food and rental and utility assistance and all of the other basic supports that people need. That's what has to happen in the immediate term. And that includes healthcare resources. So testing and not just testing, but the treatment that follows testing um, and a plan for what happens if someone tests positive, whether that person is unhoused or has any other disposition. That's the immediate need. And as the pandemic continues, it means working toward a just and equitable economic recovery. The longer term need is going to be to keep people in their homes uh, so that we don't see a deluge of, of homelessness that follows this immediate and acute phase of this pandemic. Jobs will be another need. And we're going to have to move upstream, quite frankly, to improve education, Uh, to to improve the readiness of all of our population to take advantage of jobs that pay a living wage and allow, actually, allow the entire region to flourish. People are hurting. And and these are people. (laughs) These numbers that we keep hearing on the news is somebody's family, somebody's beloved mother, father, uncle, brother, sister, cousin. So we can't rest until we address that. That's, that's what has to keep all of us going. And many people in our region have a sense of a desire to be helpful to our neighbors. And that's what has to be part of how we respond to this. We've got to get over our agendas, our affiliations, things that hold us back and just re- address the needs that people have. And they're very real needs and they're not going to go away anytime soon. We're going to be dealing with this, the fallout of this for years. I wish people understood the ways in which history has shaped the current moment. And there are a lot of people who don't know the history of St. Louis. There are a lot of people who believe that the circumstances that some in our region face are their fault, um, that they only see a slice in time and try to assign blame to individuals 
when they can't see structures and they can't see history and they can't see context and some don't want to see, even if you point to it. But I also wish people could see the opportunity that we have before us to remake St. Louis, to use this challenge and use this crisis to open our imaginations to what could be and to finally include everybody in the agenda for the region, um, to truly not leave anybody behind in this. There's opportunity in focusing on those most vulnerable among us. There's an opportunity for us to do better and for us to be better as a region. This show is produced by me, Jalian Yang, and my co-producer, Lauren Brown. This show is overseen by Tim Lloyd, senior producer of On Demand and Content Partnerships, and Robert Peterson, director of radio programming and operations at St. Louis Public Radio. From St. Louis Public Radio and PRX, this is We Live Here. Support for this podcast comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.